Got 20 minutes? Then you have time for a Bible study. Jesus, name above all names, I worship you. Jesus, you're worthy to be praised, I worship you. Welcome to another episode of 20-Minute Bible Studies. Romans 10:17 says that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Over the next several minutes, you're going to hear an important message directly from God's Word and have your faith and knowledge increased. All you have to do is listen. Now, here are your teachers. Hey everybody, I'm Andy Balog. And I'm Jordan Pine. Let's get started. About one-third of recorded teachings of Jesus Christ are parables. The Gospels contain 31 different parables. In Matthew chapter 13, the disciples ask Jesus an obvious question about this. Why do you speak to the people in parables? Jesus answers, I speak to them in parables because while seeing, they do not see, and while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. He goes on to explain that God's chosen people had lost the spiritual eyes and spiritual ears required to perceive God's plan, just as the prophet Isaiah had prophesied. On the other hand, Jesus said God granted his disciples the spiritual gift, the ability to perceive and know what he calls the mysteries of the kingdom. Jesus tells them that many prophets and righteous men had desired to have this special perception, but it wasn't God's will at that time. The message for us is clear. Parables contain the highest level of Christian knowledge, and we can access it if we behave as true disciples. With that in mind, we'll be examining the parable of the laborers today, and may we have the spiritual eyes and spiritual ears to perceive what it has to teach us. Let's listen now to the Word of God. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And when he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and to those he said, You also go into the vineyard. And whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Again he went out at about the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, Because no one hired us. And he said to them, You go into the vineyard too. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden in the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. But I wish to give this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first and the first last. That was Matthew chapter 20 verses 1 to 16. Before attempting to interpret scripture, we always use the SPACE method. SPACE is an acronym we created to remind Bible students to consider the speaker, SP, the audience, A, and the context, C, before attempting an explanation, E. Let's use the SPACE method today on the scripture readings we heard. So the speaker is Jesus and the audience is the disciples. Because the Bible is part of literature and many, including many non-believers, have discussed it, We tend to think of these passages as stories. Many have some respect for them, in fact, and they consider them maybe wise stories, as if perhaps they're reading about some smart thing that Confucius or Gandhi or Thomas Jefferson said. But that's not what's happening here at all. 
What's happening is that the creator of the universe, God the Son, is sharing with those he specially chose the most important information anyone has ever heard or will ever hear. And the only reason they and we can understand him is because God the Father has given us the amazing gift of being alive at this time in history to receive it. Amen. Now, as for the context, Jesus has just revealed a new prophecy. Many who are first will be last, and the last first. That's Matthew chapter 19, verse 30. Now, what happened is a rich man approached Jesus and asked what he would have to do to gain eternal life. Many read that as the man asking about getting into heaven, but there are two reasons that can't be right. Number one, Jews at that time already knew how to get into heaven. It was promised to them as a nation, as a whole. All they had to do was be good Jews and, of course, follow the Mosaic law. Number two, Jesus answered by talking about works. And we know salvation is not of works. It's pure grace, the gift of God. And we see that in Scripture, in the New Testament, in Ephesians chapters 2, verses 8 through 9. And Jesus spoke of works. He said, keep the Ten Commandments to the rich man. And when the man pressed him, he said, sell all you own and follow me. He didn't say, believe in me and that's it. In fact, something very interesting is said. He says, if you wish to be complete or perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. That's Matthew 19, 21. So in answer to the question, how may I obtain eternal life? Jesus said, earn it by proving you put future heavenly riches over present earthly riches. And of course, the man goes away grieving because he was really rich. Yeah, and by the way, don't let the phrase eternal life confuse you because in the Greek, it's more like the words age lasting life. And the word age is just a reference to the age when Christ Jesus will rule as king. It's the millennial kingdom age. It's the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. That is what the topic was when Jesus said eternal life. Anyway, the rich man is sad like you said, Jordan, and then soon the disciples are freaked out, if you will, because Jesus says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples say, how can anyone get into the kingdom if that's the case? And Jesus, of course, reminds them that even good works are not self-works. They're of God, with whom everything is possible. And then Peter, always the bold one, realizes what just happened. He says, great. You know, we did what you said, Jesus. We left everything to follow you. What are we going to get? And Jesus says, you'll get to rule and reign with me. I'll be the king of kings, and you'll be right underneath me, 12 rulers over the 12 tribes of Israel. Yeah, and then he adds, the same goes for anyone who sacrifices for me. They will get many times what they sacrificed. In other words, treasures in heaven. And inherit eternal life. And again, the meaning here is to gain life in the kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom. Then Jesus hits them with the words, many who are first will be last, and the last will be first, which prompts Jesus to go on to explain using the parable of the laborers. So now we know the speaker, audience, and context of our scripture reading. So we're ready for an explanation, or in this case, in the case of a parable, an interpretation. So let's start with the words at the beginning, which are very important. For the kingdom of heaven is like, and many parables begin this way. The kingdom of heaven, of course, as you mentioned, Andy, is the future, literal, earthly kingdom of Jesus Christ when he will reign for a thousand years, and that's in Revelation 24. Yeah, whenever you read that phrase, you should get ready to put on your spiritual goggles and headphones, if you will. You know, get ready to see and hear a deeper kingdom truth. So moving on, the landowner here is obviously God, and the vineyard is where he is working in the world. And he calls laborers to work for him in the world, just as Jesus called his disciples. But who are these laborers in the parable? Well, what we know is there are two main groups, the original laborers hired, and then other laborers who are found and hired throughout the day. You know, some even join at the 11th hour, which means the last minute to us in our common language, but also has a prophetic meaning, a key prophetic meaning, which is right before the end times. So anyway, evening arrives and the landowner tells the foreman to pay everyone their wages. In other words, the end times arrive and everyone who did works, labor, will get their due. Yeah, since 
this is what the kingdom of heaven is like, and the rich man and Peter were both asking about the kingdom, we know that this moment of truth must also be about the kingdom. So this is the moment of entering the kingdom, receiving one's due for good and faithful service. But notice how the laborers are paid. The words here are, quote, beginning with the last group to the first. So everyone gets paid, but the last here are the first ones, and they get the same wage. Yeah, and this causes the original laborers to grumble about the late laborers or the late day laborers only worked for a short period of time. But the landowner argues that they have it backward. It's not a slight against them. It's generosity toward these others. And this is just like what the Apostle Paul reminds us of in Romans. He writes that God said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And he adds, it does not, therefore, depend on man's desire or effort, keywords, but on God's mercy. And that's Romans 9, 15 and 16. Yeah, Jordan. And you know, this leads us to something deeper. Notice the landowner says to the original laborers, I paid you what was agreed. So go back to verse two, and then you'll notice that these laborers are hired under an agreement. And the words were, when he had agreed with the laborers. We see that, that's scriptural. So this was the Jewish understanding of how things worked. The Jews were God's people under an agreement, or we call a covenant. And the late laborers were hired under a different agreement, one which was based on generosity or what we would call grace, that saves you from wasting your life. In other words, being idle in the marketplace, standing around, doing nothing, and then pays a full day's wage for as little as one hour of work. So in other words, Jesus was teaching about God's grace and his church, which would contain both Jews those originally hired under the Abrahamic contract or Abrahamic covenant, and then the Gentiles, those joining late under grace, which we currently are of today. Okay, Andy, so let's talk about some uh, takeaways from this lesson, and let's, let's, um, let's just go through it, maybe in the form of a question and answer. Yeah, sure. Well, let me start with this, Jordan. You know, everyone gets the same wage in the parable, no matter how long they worked. Does this mean that we will all receive equal reward during the millennial kingdom? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, Andy. It's, uh, it's sort of a key question when you read this. And, um, you know, it's true that all the laborers in the parable received the same reward, a day's wage, a denarius, regardless of how long they worked. But that would be the wrong conclusion to draw here because it would mean that Jesus contradicted himself, which, of course, he would never do. Don't forget what he told the disciples. You also shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's Matthew 19, 28, right before the parable. And that's a distinct and high level of reward. Obviously, all won't equally reign at that level. He also says regarding the early Jewish believers that whatever they sacrificed, and there's going to be a lot of sacrifice because they were persecuted, they will receive many times, in some translations, a hundred times as much. And that's Matthew 19, 29. So you can definitely see uh, levels of reward and not an equal payback in that, in that sense. Yeah, Jordan. And you know, in other parables, we also see levels of reward. For example, in the parable of the Minas in Luke chapter 19, one servant gets to rule over 10 cities and then another five cities and another none, actually. Yeah, that's a great point. And we see that in other parables as well, Andy. So let's go back to Matthew nineteen twenty nine and notice something. Jesus says, everyone who sacrifices, quote, for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. Then he says in verse 30, quote, but many who are first will be last and the last first. There are two things in view there, not one. Reward, measured and conditional on sacrifice, and inheritance. It's the second one that leads to the statement about the first being last and vice versa. It's the second statement that actually opens up this parable. So it seems that Jesus is saying, Don't be surprised to see who joins you as fellow heirs. You must get over this sort of Jewish superiority complex, which, of course, we see enacted in in the Acts of the Apostles. And don't grumble as these Gentiles that are coming, who the Jews, you know, at that time viewed as dogs, end up being co-heirs alongside you in the end. Yeah. And, you know, yes, inherit eternal life in the Greek is inherit age-lasting life. So in other words, inherit the kingdom, inherit the millennial kingdom. 
So writing to the Jews and Gentiles at the church in Rome, the Apostle Paul put it best. And he said, we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, that's inheritance right there. And then he adds, if, there's a condition here, if indeed we suffer with him, that's Jesus Christ, that's during our time here on earth, before the judgment seat of Christ, before the rapture, before we find out if we make it to the millennial kingdom based on our works done by the Holy Spirit sealed in us. The condition here is if we indeed suffer with Jesus so that we might also be glorified with him. So right there, Jordan, that's the reward, and it's conditioned on our sacrifice for Jesus Christ. Okay, Andy, now I have a question for you along the lines of the everyday takeaway. What does this parable of the laborers have to teach you and me and the listeners out there um, today? Well, I think there's, there's twofold here, Jordan. Number one, we, we learned that obviously in God's view, he's showing us how amazing grace is. So from God's perspective, God the Father's perspective, we see that, as we know from Old Testament, many theologians say this as well, that Israel is known as the adulterous wife of God the Father. And that, you know, after years of her laboring for God, laboring and working and living righteously in order to get that daily wage, which we know to be, you know, a a payment of your works, here you've got a whole new group that was hanging out, the Gentiles, us today, that were grafted in, or in other words, they were brought into the fold in the last, you know, during, during the 11th hour with the last few minutes before the rapture to receive equal pay as what Israel did. In other words, we know it to be everlasting life. And for us, it was basically grace. It was unmerited favor that we only had, you know, just a little bit of effort, have faith in God, have faith in Christ. And, you have, and you're part of this group that gets to be resurrected along with the Jews. Then there's another view. There's the view of from Jesus Christ. Now that we are saved, now that we, we know that God's grace is, is in our lives, what are we going to do with that? Are we going to try to wait till the very last moment to start serving God and working for God and then expect to get you know the, this huge blessing and huge reward? Of course not. Because like we talked earlier, if we look at many of the other attached parables in context, especially in Matthew, you know, the theme, generally speaking, is about, you know, parables that lead to the millennial kingdom. So for the Jews at the time who were reading this that were converting to Christianity, they understood that we need to make room for the Gentiles too. We can't be prejudiced against them. Yes, our Messiah came and praise God, we're going to be Judeo-Christians. But there's also these Gentiles that our God is, Jesus Christ is giving them an opportunity by unmerited favor and grace to receive eternal life. So now that we're Christians, you know, you have to ask yourself, what do we do with this grace? Do we sit around and, you know, wait till the last moment? Or do we take advantage of the little bit of time we have and do the best we can to earn and build our rewards? Yeah. And I I guess, uh, Looking back at it historically, they obviously struggle with this. I mentioned the Acts of the Apostles. You see a lot of that, like this attempt to, well, you guys are new and it's kind of not fair, so maybe you have to get circumcised or eat a certain way or follow Jewish law. Like, you know, do all these extra things that we did. It's not fair that you're coming in late in the day and going to get the same essential uh, shot at inheritance. Um, I guess for us, we, we can turn that around today and say, well, you know, let's also avoid legalism and Let's, uh, let's not have a superiority complex, even if you're a mature Christian or you've been saved since you were four. Don't look down on people who are new to the faith. You know, we don't really know where we are in God's day. We know we're towards the end of the day. But let's not, let's not also fall prey to that same sort of superiority complex because, as Jesus says, if you think you're first, you, you might end up last, you know. And some of the last, the latecomers to the faith, are, are going to be able to do great things and get and get the you know and get to to be first in the kingdom of heaven and um one last thing a little little amusing aside i i often use teaches to my kids in a simplified form when they want to be first 
And uh, I say, oh, the first will be last in the kingdom of heaven. And then they try to rush to the back of the line or whatever <laughs> to be last. But, you know, even at, at a child level, it, it's, it's great to kind of keep that key lesson in mind. Agreed. And lastly, a question for you, Andy, just to sort of bring it around. What is the benefit today of studying these parables that Jesus gave back then? That's a great question, Jordan. I, I, I truly believe that, number one, we, we always have to remember that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And now that we pray that there's more listeners out there that are learning, not only that their everlasting life is secure because of what Jesus did on the cross, that we also need to know deeper into the heart of the Lord Jesus how God feels towards us now that we're believers. He wants us to gain entrance. He wants us to attain to the millennial kingdom. So the parables teach us, you know, good and bad. You know, they, not every parable is just specifically, even though they're about the kingdom, there are certain parables that, and if you study Matthew, you'll see, some of them are telling you what to do to make it to the kingdom, but some of them also tell you how not to be, not to lose the inheritance. So, you know, speaking of this particular parable, I think it's more of a warning for us to be careful. And, you know, again, back to your points earlier, to, uh, to appreciate the grace that we have and to learn from the mistakes of, you know, these people that Jesus was exemplifying, meaning the Jews of old, and, and, you know, not take for granted the love that he shows us and then use that to judge others or, you know, to separate ourselves or think ourselves being better than any other group. Thanks, Andy. And that's all the time we have for our lesson, which means we have a few minutes left to tell you about how to get more 20-minute Bible studies. Some of you are listening to this on Sirius XM channel 131, also known as Family Talk. We're on every week on Sundays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern or 5.30 p.m. Pacific. And others are listening to this as a podcast. We're on iTunes for Apple users, Google Play for Android users, and also SoundCloud, Stitcher, Acast, and TuneIn. Subscribe to our podcast in one of these places and you'll get new lessons automatically delivered to your favorite smart device. Of course, you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We post a link every time we publish a new lesson that goes straight to the recorded lesson on SoundCloud. And those places are also a great way for you to ask questions and give us feedback. Just search for our handle at MOTKORG. And last but not least, you can visit our website and sign up for email alerts about new lessons. New subscribers also get a link to a special series we did called 10 Mind-Blowing Things You Didn't Know Were in the Bible. It truly is an eye-opening set of Bible lessons that's only available when you join our email list. Just go to 20mbs.org. That's the number 20 and the letters mbs followed by .org. Finally, I'd like to take some time to tell you about one of our favorite online resources. Do you have a question about God, Jesus, the Bible, or theology in general? Do you need help understanding a Bible verse or passage? Maybe there are spiritual issues in your life for which you need advice or counsel. In other words, got questions? Well, the Bible has all the answers. And the website, gotquestions.org, can help you find them. It's a comprehensive and thorough source of Scripture-supported answers to your most challenging questions. So take our advice and give it a try the next time you have a question. Just go to gotquestions.org. That's gotquestions.org. Thanks for joining us for another 20-minute Bible study. Special thanks to the family of Pastor Gary T. Whipple, to the Abundant Life Worship Center for the music for our show, and to Tom Pine for our scripture reading. I'm Steve Zioli, and until next time, may the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Mysteries of the Kingdom Incorporated.